first off, you know, <clears throat> I thank Dr. Mar Dr. Mar for inviting me up. Uh, he he told me this morning the session was going to not be as, as dense, so he was he gave me as much he gave me liberal access to talk as long as I wanted to, as much as I wanted to, and say whatever I wanted to. And I told him that was a very dangerous thing because I may not get off the podium. So that whole schedule he put up may just be changed. By the way, it may just be me for the first four hours, and then everyone else will be crammed in for the rest of the afternoon. Just just to give you that heads up. Okay. Um, so today's interesting. I think you heard a little about genetics yesterday, probably from Ashley, right, Allison. So, uh, so you heard a little bit about that. I'm going to speak about embryology. And what that means is that I'm really not going to answer questions directly about Chiari, but I want to set a stage or a background as to how the body develops and give a little insights as to potentially what may lead to malformations like Chiari's. So it's going to be sort of a, a whirlwind tour. I get a chance to go a little slower than I initially thought. Um, I, I thought I had to really go through it pretty quickly. It's a lot of information. I see there's a lot of young people here, so I'll, hopefully it's entertaining for them. So what is embryology? I mean, em embryology really simply is how an organism develops. So how you develop. How does a human develop? How does an animal develop before birth? So how does it form? How does it how does it form its organs? How does it get organized? What should be a head? What should be a tail? What should be a chest? What should be an arm and a leg? Why, why a brain develops? How it develops? How is it coordinated with all the other organ systems? And why does it, always, and why does it work pretty well? I mean, if you think about it, um, <clears throat> you know, we all end up doing OK. We all end up having a general form. We all have a little something going on with all of us. But we all have a general form that's pretty consistent. And somehow it works, in spite of all the things that can go awry. And, and mainly we use animals to help us understand this. All right? uh, so like one of the great animals to look at is this King Charles Spaniel. Um, it has a high incidence of Chiari malformation. So it's a great animal to look at sometimes. So here's a challenge. You really can't do experiments on this animal. People, and the reason is simple. simple. This is a cute dog. <laughs> I think so. Um, I just moved into an apartment. This young woman just came up and says, I look down, and she has this dog. And I, and she's, and I look, I said, oh, it's a nice dog. She says, well, it's a King Charles Spaniel. I said, very nice. But, and she wouldn't tell me anything about the dog's name except it's a King Charles Spaniel, because she was very proud that she's paid $11,000 for this dog. <laughs> and I said, well, that actually precludes us from doing a lot of experimentation on it <laughs> at that sort of cost. But also, there's, there's actually hard, there's more resistance to do experimentation on an animal like this. But it's a great animal to study Chiari and Syrinx on, because it has a high incidence of it. So I show this to you to say that we have even challenges doing animal studies. Maybe I'll borrow her dog, uh, so I'll see. Uh, the other thing is that, so embryology, let's go back. Uh, so embryology really is, again, um, how do we study this? I want to paint a picture. First off, um, over the years, up until probably the last 20 years, um, how we really do embryology was take a snapshot at one period of time. So we can look at something happened maybe after the, the egg is fertilized and take a snapshot. We can look at what happens immediately afterwards, take another snapshot. We may, take, we may wait another hours or day or a week and take another snapshot. And then we have to have this snapshots of information so from like step one, two, or three, and then sort of fill in the gaps with our deductive reasoning abilities. But we really don't have direct information, all right, what happens between that. We take an educated guess. We think we're pretty good at making educated guesses. But, look, but clearly there's, there's gaps of information missing. So a new school way of really doing embryology is to try to really watch it real time understand what's going, try to watch cells, watch molecules, watch how one organ as it's forming, or one group of cells as they're forming, how they interact with another group of cells as it's forming. We try to watch it real time. So for instance, um, let's make this the work, oops. So on this, this video here, you're actually watching cells move, okay? So we can actually watch what happens under a microscope. And the, the great thing about it is that this picture here is a very simple one. We can label a molecule and watch what happens to that molecule as these cells are moving and dividing. We can actually then maybe 
change the function of a gene or a molecule and, see, and still go back and see the molecule and what happens to it. So in today's world, we can actually start filling in some of those bits of information to understand really what goes on. All right. So again, embryology really starts early on, like the birds and the bees, right? So first there's fertilization, so the sperm enters the egg. It, it contributes its, its genetic material. What happens next is an amazing thing. You get this single cell, but even at that level, when you first have a cell, it goes on to start developing this more complicated structure with different parts to it. But even at the level, if you look way on the right, that cell with two little dots, meaning it's genetic material, is already starting to define what should be the head, what should be the tail, what should be left and right, what should be the front and the back, or dorsal ventral. It's already started. We know this from watching how these cells move and how genetic materials move now, which we couldn't understand before. So what we see later on, we would have to take a snapshot later on and say, oh, see how it forms? There's sort of this maybe four parts to it already. But we already know even from early, earlier before that, that it's already pre-planned to go to this next step. So then it goes on to this, to this next phase of becoming more complicated called gastrulation phase. So this phase, I'm assuming it's a pointer. Oh, okay. So this phase, um, you're starting to become, this is a cross-section through it, it's scanning electron micrograph. So this is magnified a few thousand times. But we start to see that there's a layer here on the outside. This becomes ectoderm, along with the early form, formation of the, of the brain or the neural tooth. There's an intervening layer called the mesoderm. And down here is a complex slide. It just sort of shows ectoderm forms things like the, neuro, the like nervous system the brain, the spinal cord. It also forms things like the skull bones. It forms things like the skin, the pituitary gland. The mesoderm, in this area, is here. Forms things like the vertebrae, muscles, some of the other organs we have. Uh, the inner surface, the endoderm, forms things like the gut, our GI tract, our stomach, our pharynx, our, our esophagus, our intestines. Some of our other organs, like the liver, are formed within this structure. So, so the next phase after that, we're going to focus a little more on the brain and spine. So then, then you go on. So that's, that's sort of what I showed you before was a cross section like through here. But as you can see, there's still a t head region up here and a tail region. And, and as this nervous system is forming, it sort of folds over. So again, we can sort of watch these things in today's world. Okay? We can watch it. So I'm going to show you another little video. So here what happens is that you can actually see a nervous system forming. Okay? You can see that it starts to fold over. This becomes the brain and the head. This becomes the spinal cord along here. The rest is the embryo. So nowadays, we can actually watch things develop and form. So what, what, I, what I told you before was taking educated guesses, but now we actually see it. But there's a lot of information in this little video that we didn't know in, the, in this particular animal. For instance, we thought the nervous system folded up like a zipper. Here we see it as a detachment point here. And in this animal, it does seem to fold up. It starts here and then folds front up on the top part and on the bottom part. So then it folds in the head and then the tail. We, we guessed that before, but now we can watch it. There's other, there's other animals, if I showed you a different video, you find that there may be a, a different sort of fusion point. So there may be a fusion point here first, and then the rest folds, but another one down here or another one way up here. So there may be three fusion points, which, which we also think happens in humans at times. So we can watch things now. So furthermore, after you form that, I sort of alluded to the fact this would be the head, that would be the tail. Uh, but if you go back a second, I didn't really, I sort of told you a guess, right? I said, hey, this looks like it's going to be the brain and the head. This is going to be the spinal cord, or this would be the chest area, and that's going to be the tail area. But can you really tell that on that picture? Not yet, right? It doesn't really have a defined area. One part looks a little thicker, but that's all you can really tell at this stage, right? So, but there are processes that happen after that, okay? So that's called segmentation. So now you start to form a structure with multiple cells, starting to form organs, but then you actually start to form various segments or sections 
within the body. Okay, you follow me so far? I'm not. All right. So these sections we know the head regions and the chest regions and the abdomen regions. Remember the limbs sort of stick off the sides anyway. The arms stick off up here and the legs come off down there. And there's obviously a tail region. Right. Uh, this has really been studied in a fruit fly at first. So back in the, I know it wasn't that long ago for some of us, but you know, really in the 70s and early 80s, the fruit fly, the Drosophila, was the main way we studied genes and body organization. Why? Because fruit flies develop in about a day. So you know how long, so you can do a lot of work if you can take a lot of flies and study them over a day. The most amazing thing is that a fly develops very similar to a human. We never thought that. That's sort of a paradigm shift. That's a different way of thinking. We find that a lot of animals have the same basic organization, even insects, and even an enemy, right, have the same basic organization that a human does. You wouldn't look at it for, at the end result, but early on there's a very similar patterning to it. So we can use the information. There is a head area, there is a chest area, and there's an ab abdomen area, just similar to a human. The difference is they have wings coming off up here, we have arms. Um, they do also have legs. They come off a little, okay, most humans don't have six sets of legs, I got that. But there's, so there are some differences. But the overall basic patterning is the same, so we can use the information in a similar way, right? So again, the, as it comes out, the, the brain, and, the, the, brain and, and the embryo and the human is segmented. There is a head area. And even within the brain itself, we know there's a sort of a folding. There's a brain fold that forms the cerebrum, or the top part of the brain. There's another fold that forms the back part of the brain, or what's called the brainstem, and where the cerebellum develops. And there's another part that develops the spinal cord. We know these segments. They correlate to things like where the heart forms, and the lungs, and the kidneys. They all sort of are segmented in very regimented, orderly fashion. We know there's genes that control that, these segmentations. So you hear about some of the genetic studies, and part of the way we understand the genes is by going back and seeing how they, how they play a role in this developmental process. So we can play with those. So we've, we see, a, if we find a gene in a human, we say, oh, you got this gene defect, if we happen to find one. We can then go back and play with it in an animal and say, well, well, what does it really do? If we have a good way of studying it, we can say, what does it really do? Does it really lead to this problem or not? How does it affect the, the body as it's organized and develops? How does it do that? So we can actually look at those. There's some common genes that are important. I'm not going to bore you with all these, but a lot of these, these are very early genes that help pattern or help develop early segmentation or, or what really helps define what is head, what is the brain stem and, and cerebellum, what is spinal cord. Again, you can sort of watch this. Here's, here's this is a video, uh, again, showing you that the red shows increased gene expression, and I won't bore you with that, but you can watch how the gene expresses and then what happens afterwards, okay? Let's so say you can start combining these things, okay? So if you watch closely, this is over, uh, sorry, I have a mosquito, I have a mis uh, Michigan mosquito flying around. So if you watch, you'll see a wave. It turns and then you'll start to see a segment develop in the vertebrates, right? You'll see a wave of expression and you'll see a segment develop. And if you look closely at this, I'll let this keep playing. So if you watch this closely, you'll find that there's those, it flashes at certain, it sort of jumps almost, those waves. So, and I'm going to show you some other genes that there's actually sort of regions or zones of gene expression, and then they, they result in a part of a segment that forms. It's not just linear, it doesn't just totally, it's, so if go back and look at it again, it's, it's not just simply, uh, it's not just, turns on all the way down, it flashes, it flashes, it flashes. And so we can see patterns of gene expression. And it correlates to therefore organizing a certain part or segment, okay? So hopefully it's starting to make some sense. So these are just tools that we can use as we start asking questions as to what may go wrong in, during development. Now we have these tools we can play with. We can start, we can start understanding them.
So for instance, a very important set of genes is called Hox genes. Um, Hox genes are, since I have a few minutes, I'm going to teach you a little more about Hox genes. Hox genes are called homeo, homeo, homeobox genes. They got this term because, uh, let's, let's focus down here. Let's go back to our friend of fruit fly again. Okay? So a normal fruit fly looks like this. Okay? There's a head, there's little antennae or feelers off the head, there's six sets of legs that makes it an, in, an insect, I guess, not a spider. There's a thorax and an abdomen and wings coming off. <clears throat> what we found was that a certain problem with one of those genes actually changed how the segment developed. For instance, this segment in this guy has these, instead of antennae, I mean, instead of antennae, they actually turn into legs. So this is called the antennapedia, or pedia meaning legs, so now the antennae look like legs. This other one has two thoracic segments, so it duplicated it. So it's called bithorax, because now each wing, there's a little wing here and another wing here, because instead of having one thoracic segment, it had two. And it was found that the, these, this set of genes that expressed helped regulate or control that specification of what that segment should become. So here's what that means. So this isn't a fruit fly again, right? So what, what does that mean? So when I was a, a fellow, when I was a resident, uh, I know, was, I'm not quite as old as Dr. Basdorf, but, uh, I, but in, the, in the 80s, I was, uh, uh, <coughs> I was doing my residency and went off into the lab and doing research. And at that time, the fruit fly was the main way of understanding gene functioning. But at that time also, there was a brilliant scientist up at Yale. His name was Bill McGinnis, or William McGinnis. What he found was that the same set of genes that helped control this fruit fly were the same set of genes that were found in, in other animals, like the human, like a mouse. So because of that, and we found that those genes were responsible for the very same organization and, and how the body patterns itself, how it becomes segmented and regimented. So there's a very similarity. So we have, we have, so in these genes, 96%, almost all the gene structure is the same in a fruit fly as it is in a human. We have actually share the same genes. The, that's why we all have the same basic body plan. So we're really not as different from a fruit fly. So next time you, you kill a mosquito or kill a fly, you may think about that, right? <laughs> so we have a lot more similarities than we ever thought. So he coined the term, this was a homeobox, because he found that, that within this gene, there was a, a very specific region that helped lead to the termination. These are called transcription factors. They actually, they actually control other genes to, to, to function. And, um, and he found that they, they, were, they, weren't, they were very consistent across all these animal species. Not only that, later on the work went further and found that these genes weren't just consistent across animals. There was a very specific way they were expressed. So some correlated to how the head region formed. Some correlated to how the, the, the junction of the, the neck region or chest region or abdomen region. And their gene expression, if you look, if you go back to that video, they're sort of clumped together, right? So they're clumped together. And we can see, what, that's why in that video we saw waves of expression. If those set of genes get expressed, it then determines what happens to that segment. Does that make sense? So far, you following me? I hope I'm not losing everybody. So we can use this, right, to start understanding maybe what happens. So for instance, if, if you, remember I said if you alter the expression of it, you may drive it to look like something it shouldn't be. So, so let, let's take a practical example. Let's take an example of this. If, if this is supposed to be the occipital bone or the back of the skull, these are occipital expression. Oh, by the way, I didn't, uh, there's a lot of information I didn't tell you. These, these Hox genes really are very important for development of everything from the level of we call the midbrain. Embryologically, it's called the isthmus organizer. Don't worry about that. If I go back for a second, I'll show you what it means. So you see on this, you see on this, on this, this is the nervous system. So here's, will be prosencephalon, which is the brain. Here's the mesencephalon, which is the midbrain. And this is the brain stem and, and um, the cerebellum would come off of here. And here's the spinal cord. But if you see this flexion here, how it's bent, 
You saw that even on that video, there's a bending right here. Well, that bending, this junction right here, is right, this, this area right here is a very important point. So from, if you look at it from a picture point of view, it bends, but also that's a point where there's a, there's a huge change of gene expression. So everything up here in front of that level, you can sort of see it here, there's that organized level, is controlled by a certain group of genes, these OTX genes and all the other stuff. Below that level are all those Hox genes expression. So here, so everything below here, this sort of midbrain, hindbrain junction, or isthmic organizer embryologically, everything else, see these are Hox genes that help control their pattern. So if you go to that, you'll find that, uh, oops. All right, so, so I sort of cheated again, I sort of jumped the gun. Uh, so here's, that's why we're only looking at the Hox genes in the back of the skull. So I thought it might be important to understand what goes on in like, things like maybe affect the back part of the brain and skull, right? So here, what we can do is that we find that if we disturb some of the genes, right, which we can do in, in the lab, let's say, you, you, let's say you change this occipital region, this, let's say you make the cervical region, instead of being more cervical, we can make it, we can drive it towards being more occipital. So we can take the occipital expression gene and drive it and express it in the, in the neck area. And what we found is that when you do that, you start causing abnormal fusions. Even in, this is a human, but I can show this to you in the mouse. I figured I'd just show you a human picture. So what we see is fusions or occipital cervical fusions, right? You, you may have seen this, assimilation of the atlas. You've probably heard of these things. I have atlas assimilation or I have clipophile or some other segmentation where it didn't segment properly. Well, particularly here, because it starts to look much more like the back of the skull should look. And when we see these fusion anomalies, the same duplication we see in a mouse or a chicken embryo or something else, we think those are probably, we can, we can make those happen from abnormal functioning of Hox genes. So my, I'm proposing, so remember I said that you still have to have an educated guess. I'm going to propose that maybe some of these are derived from Hox gene-like function. Right. So now we can start understanding it. We may not find a mutation, so we do a genetic study in the Hox gene, because it does so many things, but you may find some of the downstream genes that are affected by these Hox genes might be responsible for some of the problems we see in the, in the development of the skull back there. We also know it controls brain development, too. Now, I'll get into that a little more in a minute. So that's one way. We can change the direction. Let's say now we want to drive it to look more cervical. So we can play with this stuff in the lab. Instead of making it more occipital, let's see what happens if we drive it more, uh, more cervical. So again, in the lab, I'm going to jump to a human example. Um, we can make the occipital bone, here's the clivus, separate and look more. We can do the same thing in the lab. You can make it look more like a, like a, like a vertebrae, separated, mobile, similar to what we see here, as opposed to it being, you know, this should be fused together along the clivus, along the back, the front part of the occipital region of the skull, or the suboccipital region of the skull should be fused. Here is not fused, and we can see the same thing in animals. If we just drive the Hox genes to, to look more, express more cervical genes, or the genes that would, would make things look more cervical-like in the head area, same thing. So I'm just going to propose that perhaps genes like this can help us understand why, you know, we see problems like Chiari. Uh, <clears throat> it's not quite that simple. Um, so I will say that at least in Chiari 1, I sort of threw some bony problems with you. The problem is that when you relate the same thing to the brain, um, if you change expression patterning, so here's, uh, so we know, uh, so let me teach a little bit about how the cerebellum develops in the back part of the brain. All right. uh, a little bit of that. Again, we go back. Here's, this is more just the same sort of scheme painted in different pictures. Okay? This is a more simplified form. We know that in the hindbrain region, or that back part of the brain, this is really the, we call pons and the pons and medulla, so below the midbrain. That is the area that develops the, the cerebellum. In fact, that's really divided up into different little swellings we saw before called rhombomeres on a previous picture. And uh, I'll take a second to go back and show you that. So 
Here are these areas called rhombomeres, right? There's certain segments that are determined by things like Hox genes. And we know that the cerebellum is derived from these first two rhombomeres, okay? We know that, we know that the vermis comes from mainly the junction of the, the midbrain and the, this area, the midbrain, hindbrain junction, and rhombomere, what we call one on this situation. And we know that the rest of the hemispheres of cerebellum come mainly from a contribution of one, but mainly two. So the cerebellum doesn't just grow out of it. Actually, the mid part develops from one part of the rhombomere, and the, the, what we call the lateral part, or, or the hemispheres, develop from a different part. So the tonsils actually develop from the hemispheres. So we also know, let me jump it up again. So here's what we know. So that's what this sort of depicts. There's these areas called rhombic lips. Don't worry about that. The rhombic meaning rhombomere, or back part of the brain. And there's these protrusions, and that's where the cerebellum develops from. We know those are controlled by certain genes. We know that if you have a normal looking brain, but if you perturb, or if you now go back and mess with the genes to help control cerebellar development, you actually end up with lack of a cerebellum. <laughs> like a Dandy Walker malformation. That's different than the Chiari. Well, it may be like Chiari 4, actually, <laughs> but it's not like the Chiari we see. So we can see direct, we see that there's a, so if you look at these pictures, here's normal again. We see that if you disturb it, the pons is elongated and the medulla is abnormal and the cerebellum is abnormal. When you disturb genes that express, and this has been correlated in humans, this, I'm sort of jumping again to human to give you an example. Um, when you, when you disturb those first two rhombomere, you can get other patterning problems. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm not sure if a true Chiari malformation is a, is a disturb, or a Chiari 1 particularly is what we're mainly focused on, and maybe Chiari 2, but Chiari 1, I'm not sure if it's a disturbance of brain development. Because if you disturb brain development, you should see other things that go wrong within the brain, fundamentally. It may be a problem of bone development but not necessarily brain patterning development, at least in those Chiari 1. Uh, another set of genes is Pax genes, which helps. So, so that's sort of take home. I guess in Chiari 1 malformations, I'm not particularly convinced that it's a problem of brain development, even though brain function is affected, okay, at least in Chiari 1. Now, again, it's a, everything's a spectrum, so what I'm saying now may be totally wrong. I may walk out on, today's what, July 24th? July 25th, I may come back with a whole different story. But at least as of now, I'm not totally convinced. Another set of genes, which I've, I'll briefly mention, is called Pax genes. Um, they're another type of homeo, they, they also have a, a box, a conserved box, like homeobox, like Hox genes, but they have a different other structure, so they get a different name. They seem to be important for not, not let's say, making a segment, but in, but in giving that segment a certain pattern of how the cells go on and develop from there. So if you are going to be a hindbrain, it'll help, it'll help determine, uh, okay, what cells should grow in that, in, that, in that cerebellar region or in that hindbrain region. It'll help further pattern it. So, so it'll help determine what it should look like in detail. So the next step. Uh, I'll say we think Pax genes might be responsible for some patterning, even in bones. So I'll just throw it out there. There hasn't been proof of this totally. There's been some hints of it. But I'm not, I'm not thoroughly convinced that that's what's going to, even though the overall structure looks good, but I'm not, I'm not totally convinced that even though the pattern of this clivus looks a little abnormal, We've seen that in Pax2 mutations, but I'm not thoroughly convinced that happens in humans totally. So there's a whole lot of genes that all play roles very, in a very similar manner. All right, they all really are very early genes that help pattern, segment, give identity to certain regions in the body. All right, in a lot of these genes, you'll find that people are studying to see whether or not they affect, you know, uh, uh, Chiari malformation, or we'll find it on other genes that may be downstream, or are there other factors that, that mean downstream, meaning that these genes, are, these genes are designed to turn on other genes. They're called transcription factors. 
So maybe there are other factors down, down that are affected by these genes that still might lead to these problems. So at the end of the day, um, what we really need are human studies to understand embryology. Uh, the, th the funny part about it is not <clears throat> as far away as you might think. <laughs> uh, so one way from an embryological point of view is that you can do what is called, develop these called organoids. We've actually done some work with this. Um, so what's an organoid? So you can take a human skin cell, a fibroblast. So that's going to have the genetic material of you in it and reverse engineer it to turn it into, so you can take a fibroblast, turn it into a primitive stem cell, and then instruct it to develop into whatever you want it to develop into. Because once it becomes a stem cell, meaning a primitive cell that has the potential to develop anything else, I can, you can then throw all these genes and a certain organization and pattern and drive its development into something different. So you can take a skin cell. Now this is not embryonic stem cells, this is a skin, a biopsy of a skin, of you. Well, it actually works better in younger people, by the way, than when you do this. If you take old skin, it doesn't work as well. I don't know why. I tried it. I got my own punch biopsy done. Didn't work quite as well, which really disturbed me because I realized I was getting older. Um, <laughs> but you did a younger person, it actually worked well. Um, this is not our study, but I'll just show you that you can actually take this and develop a primitive brain, which actually looks similar to the different layers you see in the brain. Okay? This is small but you can develop it. In fact, it functions. If you do what is called patch clamp, if you actually do a, stick a needle electrode into one of these cells in different regions, it functions and fires off. So you actually develop a mini brain, or at least a part of a mini brain, if you drive it with certain, so this was induced with genes that, or, or do, induced in a, in, a, in a background that drove for brain differentiation. And you can actually get brain function. In fact, this study here was interesting because they, they, they did the same thing. They took a normal and they took a kid who had microcephaly and their stem cells actually developed a mini brain that was microcephalic. They had abnormal brain pattern we see in microcephaly when we, when we reverse engineered it. So here now, instead of using animals, you might be able to take a human, borrow a piece of skin, reverse engineer it and figure out maybe what went wrong and why you develop or why that, that human developed that pattern of, of problem. By, because those genes are already intrinsic inside of you, <laughs> or inside of that individual we got it from, as opposed to making it up and, and us externally driving it. So this is the level of science is getting to for the future. This has been fairly recent over the past, you know, four or five years. So, but this is the level of science now that can go, where you can actually reverse engineer. You can do it for tumors. You can do it for all sorts of stuff. Because especially pediatric tumors are probably developmental in nature. You could do the same thing. But you can drive it now. So we can apply all this stuff in an animal and start looking at sort of human tissue. You can't regrow a little human, by the way. But you can look at a certain specific part. Because these are so small, there's no blood supply to it. If you're going to grow something big, you need a blood supply, you need lungs, you need all this other stuff. So nobody's doing Frankensteinian work and developing little humans, by the way. You're not going to be able to grow an organ big enough to replace it inside your body either. So for those of us who are getting older who think maybe we can get some organ replacement, it's not going to work either. But you can definitely do some micro experiments, which is actually very interesting. So again, so here's the dilemma. How am I doing time? OK. OK. So, uh, so here's the dilemma, right? So is the curi malformation a primary problem of development, right? Or now we have another thing, right, which you hear about often. Or is it really secondary to some other mechanism, some other consequence? So it may not be, the, may not be totally developmental in, in, in what happens, even though we think there's at least a large component that's developmental, or it may be partially developmental. So we look at these classifications again. Uh, we sort of look at them as, you know, there's type 1. Some people affectionately call things type 1.5. I'm sure you guys are going to discuss, so I won't steal anybody's thunder, all these different types, types twos, type zeros. I always look at Benny Iskandar, uh, type three, type fours. And we know we can group them together in certain patterns. Um, and the reason why we group them together is that we can then 
study them some from an embryological point of view that makes some sense. So QRE1s, for instance, we think, you know, I would propose that we think probably something to do with segment identity, particularly in, in the bony confines. The brain is probably okay, okay? But however, we know that to see this malformation, there may be other mechanisms that drive it. It may be something else that drives what we see. So, we, so you often hear about this push down, pull down, squeeze down theories or mechanisms. So it may not be all developmental. It may be, a, it may be partially based on a developmental problem or an embryological problem, but there may be other factors. Type twos, we know that are usually associated with a kid with spina bifida. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that, is it really a neuro, is a problem of, is it, is it a primary problem just of how the neuro, nervous system closed and everything else happens secondarily? Or is it still a patterning problem, a segment identity problem? Actually, I think it's probably gonna be much more of a segment patterning problem, if anything, and uh, like a Pax gene problem. And the reason why this is confusing is that an article came, you know, you've heard about prenatal, you know, in, intrauterine repair of myelomeningocele. Um, one of the big tenets of intrauterine repair of myelomeningocele is that you don't have hydrocephalus and, it, and you don't have a significant Chiari. But if you really look at this, here's a, here's a kid, typical kid with a Chiari too, and the top, here's a Chiari II, the, the separation between cerebellum and the cerebrum is very vertical, it's called the tentorium, it inserts low. You notice that there's a big, large protrusion of the tonsils of the cerebellum, and the brainstem is also a bit low. Here's the, here's the junction of frame magnum, so here's the pons, the medulla is way down here too. The fourth ventricle is low. This is a typical Chiari II patient. So in, in the myelomeningocele patients that were repaired, you don't see the protrusion of the brain, Okay, but if you look at, if you forget that part and look at just the overall pattern back here, it doesn't look that much different than a kid who has significant protrusion. So again, I think there is a force that's, that's causing it to happen. So what they claim is that if you repair it, you don't get the, maybe so the brain doesn't herniate down. But the, the pattern of the back part of the skull is still abnormal. It's not normal yet. So you may not get the symptoms or the problems as a result of having the cerebellum pushed down and the brainstem pushed down. But the skull is still based on an abnormal developmental pattern. So I think there's a combination of effects here. There's clearly a combination. You can study this again in sheep embryos. We have a model looking at sheep and with spina bifida and we, see, we can see sheep can have herniated tonsils and you can see this on this, this MRI is a little dark, but you can see that at least back here there's white, so there's space, and here the tonsils are herniated down. So you can see it in the sheep, and we can play with the same thing. If you repair a sheep in your uterine, you get less tonsil herniation. <laughs> but they still have some difference in the pattern of the back part of the skull. Chiari 4, again, I think uh, we, this is, no one really talks about it anymore. But I honestly think QRI4 shouldn't be called, well, there's a whole debate on terminology anyway, whether or not anything should be called a QRI, maybe we should change the whole terminology. I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. But on the same token, I think uh, if we look at how the cerebellum develops, and this is sort of a scheme of that, I, I alluded to it before, uh, QRI4 is, is lacking of the cerebellum, a hypoplasia of the cerebellum. I think that, but if you look at those patients, they also have an abnormal brainstem. I think they actually are just a problem of brain development. Probably those high rhombomeres. It has nothing to do with true what we think of squeezing and tightness. So QRI4 probably should be off the list, totally. So I want to make an official push to remove QRI4 from the list forever. I hope everybody votes with me. This is a political campaign, so I'm not a Republican or I don't claim to be a Democrat, I'm independent. So, so this is not a political issue. But I'm gonna to vote to try to uh, you know, get QRI4 off the list. I don't think it should belong. I'm not convinced QRI3 should belong either. Right? I think those are different malformations. We should probably get rid of QRI2. <laughs> I think that's a different disease. I think we should be left with what we, what we affectionately call QRI1, and then, therefore, we, since it's the only one, we don't have to call QRI1 anymore, and we can actually start defining it. That's my real take home from today. Again, if you look at these, you'll find that Again, I think this group is really developmental with, a, with some secondary factors. 
I think other things are maybe small posterior fossas associated with synostosis or other cranial deformities. Um, two and three, I think, is associated with either abnormal hindbrain development or, or associated with some other congenital anomaly of the nervous system. So again, probably a different disease. Type three, I think, is a problem of bone development fundamentally, like other encephalus seals we see should be off the list. So I want to say my thing is I think we should classify them as this group, and the rest we should rename them and just get them off the list. So bottom line, I think they're all different various forms. I think they're formed by different mechanisms. And because of the tools we have today, we can define better. They really are different diseases. They're formed by different mechanisms, by different genes, by different, th so I'm jumping a little bit because I don't have all evidence of this. But my suggestion, my strong suggestion, is they're really fundamentally different diseases. I think we need to reclassify them <clears throat> and, and focus on, on how we really understand how they develop right, and what other mechanisms may affect development, right? So whether there are other pushing or pulling factors that affect development. I think uh, QRI1 is, should be our focus, um, but again, there's a lot of details with that we need to define. You'll hear a lot more about this in this conference. And again, I sort of, I sort of, beat, I sort of said this already. I just think we need to reterm things. I think we need to give, I, I affectionately, you know, respect Dr. Chiari, but I want to get rid of his name off the list and call it totally something different. Because I think the assumptions, um, if you see an x-ray just with something, we call it this disease and has implications, and that doesn't mean that's what's going on. So, I think we've got to get it out of our terminology and sort of start over again. So with that in mind, um, I'm open for questions. Oh, sorry, we'll do questions at the end. Yeah, I'm sorry. I won't jump the gun. So thank you very much.